Today on the Life Science Success Podcast, I'd like to welcome Praveen Ramamurthy. Welcome, Praveen. Thank you, Don. Thank you for the opportunity to be part of this uh, podcast. Yeah, thanks so much. So can you tell the listeners a little bit about yourself? Uh, I, by way of uh, my interest, you know, I had this tremendous interest when I was in high school to become a doctor, a physician. And after I read some articles on HIV research and azithromycin and all the drugs that were coming out in, in the late, uh, in the early 90s, I decided to change path and become a researcher because I thought as a researcher, as a scientist, I could influence, uh, you know, so many more lives than as a physician seeing one patient at a time. So that sort of uh, continues even today. I'm still wired like a physician in a way. In terms of what drives me, I'm very passionate about translating, you know, ideas and concepts into precision medicine, therapeutics and diagnostics. So that's really what drives me. Uh, what I enjoy the most is the entrepreneurial environments and envisioning the future, working towards the future. I'm always someone who is obviously trying to execute on the present, but always dreaming about the future. And uh, I would say I'm a lifelong learner and I want to be that way. I love challenges, new learning opportunities. That's why I've traversed all the segments in the biopharma space, right? From biologics development to diagnostics to devices and now cell and gene therapies. Yeah, it's uh, it, it, being a continual learner in our current space is something that almost seems like it's a it's a natural demand anymore because right. there's so much information. Um, I know I have a lot of tools that help me kind of get all the right information in our space, but uh, for sure there's a lot going on. You happen to mention the entrepreneurial spirit. So, um, you know, a little bit of a background in terms of, you know, where you are currently and what are you doing right now? So right now I'm working on two things. One is um, the area of, uh, you know, stem cells to regenerate uh, pancreatic beta cells to treat diabetes patients. And uh, as part of uh, being a faculty member at the University of Colorado, I'm also working on a cancer immunotherapy, um, which employs a gene engineered uh, tumor infiltrating lymphocyte. And we can get into details, but essentially um, the idea is to remove uh, tumor uh, homing lymphocytes uh, from the tumor and engineer them to make the tumor lymphocytes even more aggressive to attack the tumor. Yeah, so I haven't really, I haven't really interviewed uh, anybody yet on the podcast that does anything in the in the realm of diabetes. So this is a, a new area for me. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I guess the, you know, in terms of um, you know things that you're working on, you know, is this all new in this space? Uh, you know, using stem cells in the space, or is it something that that there are several, um, you know, new things that are coming in the space for type one and type two diabetes? This is uh, fairly new, I would say. Uh, one of the most uh, pioneering uh, companies uh, called Sema Therapeutics is already in clinical trials right now. Um, they've got the RMAT designation from the FDA. They're on an accelerated path to the clinic. And uh, a few years ago, they were acquired by Vertex for a very large sum of money. So I think that tells you that the potential is there to take stem cells and make them into any type of cells that you desire, right? And in this case, uh, you know, we're talking about uh, cells that produce insulin, mm -hmm. but one could think about cells that could, stem cells that could turn into nerve tissue. Sure. You know, and those sorts of advances are also happening. Uh, and that's what's most exciting about the space. Yeah, very good. Yeah. So, um, so tell me a little bit about your journey from India to Clemson. So you went to Clemson University and uh, I just find it interesting when, you know, somebody leaves, you know, one geography to go to school in another, you know, it's one thing whenever that geography is still connected by an ocean uh, or connected by land, excuse me, and doesn't have an ocean lying in between. Mm -hmm. it, but uh, That's quite a distance for you. Yeah. You know, in the mid nineties, when I finished my master's graduate program in medical microbiology, which was again, a very clinically oriented program. Uh, all of us 
uh, at that time did not have much to do in India. Either you went to graduate school in India and then still came to the US for your fellowship or you came to the US or Australia or you know UK for your PhDs or fellowships. So I happened to have two of my former mentors and senior uh, students, you know, who were already enrolled at Clemson. And I thought, uh, well, you know, uh, they'd be of uh, tremendous help to me and they could continue to mentor me. And so, and, and we didn't have the internet in those days. So really you had to rely a bit on word of mouth as to how the school is, what's the cost of living, which was also an important factor uh, to, to consider, you know, coming from there. So that's sort of how I, I got into Clemson. Uh, and I knew that they had a pretty reasonably good, uh, you know, biological sciences program and, and areas of interest uh, for me were in viral immunology and such. And so I think that's sort of how I went into Clemson. Yeah. So um, in terms of, you know, biology and virology, you know, really what, what led you to your role at Regenerative Medical Solutions? Well, that's a, a long, but uh, hopefully an interesting story I can say, but uh, it's an interesting journey, you know, where a lot of my personal experiences, you know, ended up defining what I pursued, you know, what sort of opportunity I pursued in most cases. So, uh, as I said, initially, my passion was in viral immunology. And uh, in a high school, I, in fact, won a, a, a statewide prize for my work, uh, you know, showing how HIV uh, hijacks the immune system. So that stuck to me a lot. So I was always interested in, you know, uh, working at the interface of virology and immunology. So when I landed at, in Clemson, I could not find that exact fit. So I was a little bit disappointed, but then my mentors and friends said, listen, you're in the US, you have to sort of open up your brain, you have to be open to things. And And so I said, okay, let me now continue to explore. And so I did a bunch of these you know, this PhD, uh, you know, pre dissertation PhD projects, right? One on DNA repair, I did one, I did one on DNA fingerprinting. And finally, I was picked by a professor to work in the area of breast cancer therapeutics, um, wherein we take prolactin and we modified it into an antagonist. And that became a potent uh, drug for breast cancer, at least in the test tubes and in the animal models. During that time, my mother was. Uh, diagnosed with glioblastoma at the age of 50 and so that was devastating to me but I found that my PhD project you know helped me cope better with my mother's cancer because I felt like I was helping patients with cancer I felt like I was fighting the cause in a way you know with uh, with my work and I began to think how could we have detected this cancer earlier you know in, in my uh, you know in my mom's case and I, I, and I always, uh, what hit me was gene-based diagnostics. Perhaps we could have found something uh, if we had uh, done some sort of uh, gene-based diagnostics for early detection. And fortunately, I joined, uh, I was recruited to join Walter Reed Army Institute of Research, which is the US Army's uh, largest uh, biological research facilities, where um, I was working, I was inducted into a project, uh, a DARPA-funded project where uh, the immune system was being used as a biosensor to detect uh, different viruses, bacteria, and all of that. And the way uh, we were doing it was uh, we're uh, snooping in on the immune response. And as the immune response takes place, there's a bunch of molecular signatures that are put out there in the way the cells respond to a certain virus, a bacteria, or fungus. And by using gene chips to snoop in on that, we were able to did, uh, we were able to actually uh, diagnose which uh, virus it is, so which bacteria it is, and so that drew me a lot because I thought I could use the same principles to uh, uh, to identify uh, to detect cancer earlier, you know, and uh, that sort of uh, was going on, and I, I was anyways oriented towards industry and uh, got a call from Medimmune where my former mentor and friend was there and I wanted to get into drug development. And that's where I learned all the basics, as they say, the 101 or the ABCs of drug and vaccine development. And I also could uh, work on some cancer uh, therapy projects and all of that. But even then, during that time at Medimmune, I was constantly interested in biomarkers and how one could uh, sort of bring the diagnostic element to accelerate 
um, uh, therapeutic development. And, you know, it used to be called translational medicine sure. uh, groups in those days. Yep. And uh, I could not find any such opportunities, but I knew that diagnostics was the key for therapeutic success, wherein one could target certain sets of people, of, uh, you know, or with a certain genetic profiles in order for us to be able to hit them with the right drug at the right time, mm-hmm. uh, uh, you know, for the right patient. And again, fortuitously, I, I got recruited by National Jewish Health in Denver. So that's what brought me from California to Denver, where I had this opportunity to build a personalized medicine diagnostics department um, and integrate it with the institution-wide, uh, you know, personalized medicine initiative uh, at uh, National Jewish. I love this job because it was three jobs, not one job. One was a faculty member. The other was an entrepreneur trying to build a whole new uh, program and also try to be financially independent, you know, so become a contract research organization, develop tests and figure out reimbursements and all of that. And uh, again, the most uh, uh, precious part of this job that I, that I still miss is uh, being a laboratory director, being able to work with physicians on what tests to order. And then once the tests were ordered, you know, how to provide them with the clinical decision support, the consulting. So I really uh, took part in clinical care. And I think to this day, I would say must have at least signed more than 40,000 plus patient reports uh, ranging from cancer to infectious disease to so many uh, different uh, uh, rare diseases and such. And uh, during that time, uh, I got recruited about seven years. I was uh, at National Jewish, and then I got recruited by uh, uh, an Indian bioinformatics powerhouse called Strand Life Sciences. And they wanted me to help them transform from being a bioinformatics company into a brick and mortar, uh, next gen sequencing based diagnostics company in India. And the mission was uh, to engage in affordable innovation where we brought the price of these sophisticated genomic tests to at least one fourth of the cost of what was uh, in the US for cancer testing as well as for rare disease testing because the affordability uh, was much uh, very, very low. Uh, a very, you know, it would, the costs were very high for people to afford it. So I think we ended up uh, uh, doing it very well and it ended up uh, producing uh, uh, a situation where, uh, you know, even middle class people can now afford these tests. And, uh, uh, you know, a few years before that, my child had been diagnosed with autism. So I tried a few genomic tests and, you know, to me, the answer was, well, you know, genomics can tell you what is wrong, what's the molecular switch that's gone awry, but what can we do about it was uh, this constant uh, thought in my mind. And, uh, you know, I thought, okay, maybe stem cells might be a way to do it. And so in my life, I've always looked at the universe and prayed and said, here's what I want to do. Here's where I want to go. And and somehow the path opens up for me, though I've never been trained in, in that particular area. You know, even the National Jewish job was something I never trained in. I'd never run a clinical lab and I got it. Similarly, a Terumo BCT, a billion dollar cell and gene therapy and transmission medicine company, you know, the CEO was my mentor and uh, I worked with him for many months before I, he thought he could recruit me into lead science and clinical globally. And that's how I got into the area of cell and gene therapy with iPSCs, induced pluripotent stem cells, mesenchymal stromal cells, hematopoietic stem cells. Uh, CAR-Ts, you know, worked with companies like Novartis and Kite in, uh, you know, in helping them succeed with their CAR-T programs. And uh, that continues to be my inspiration even today is the world of cell and gene therapy. And uh, subsequently I joined, uh, I got recruited to regenerative medicines, uh, medical solutions uh, where, you know, as we spoke about working on iPSCs and how to differentiate them into uh, beta cells and uh, continue to think about, you know, how can I get into the space of making brain organoids and neural cells, or how could I use gene therapy to help my child? Sure. And so I've had the benefit of uh, working with or being in touch with, uh, you know, some really thought leaders in this space, like Mahendra Rao, like Alison Motori at uh, UC San Diego, who's actually making brain organoids and such. 
Very nice. Yeah. I mean, this is the place to be right now with, uh, with regards to personalized medicine for sure. And, you know, it seems to me like, um, like we've got just such tremendous opportunity right now. One, we can kind of see what's happening in, in your DNA and RNA. Um, now to your point, right. Can we actually implement things that'll let us do something about it is kind of that seems like that next natural step. And I feel like a lot of people are taking, um, you know, taking those steps, you know, do you have, uh, you know, additional things or thoughts that, that you would have in terms of, you know, personalized, uh, therapies that, uh, that you'd like to see in the world? Well, I think the, you're beginning to see the tip of the iceberg emerge in the form of uh, tremendous success with the chimeric antigen receptor T-cell therapies. The clinical efficacy of it has just been unbelievable, right? Mm -hmm. And now you have many more different generations of CAR-T, variants of CAR-T uh, coming up, T-cell receptor uh, you know, therapeutics coming up. And uh, the one that I'm uh, working on at the University of Colorado is uh, also a very interesting way in which you can hit solid tumors because CAR-Ts have been most successful with liquid tumors, but CAR-Ts have had some issues with uh, penetrating the tumor microenvironment, the fortress of the tumor. And so I think uh, cells that have, T cells that have been in the uh, in a tumor microenvironment, like the tumor infiltrating lymphocytes, uh, might be uh, you know a great uh, way to go in terms of treating uh, solid tumors. And so, Iovance, for instance, is uh, an exceptionally well capitalized company in the U.S. doing some great work. They license their technology from Dr. Rosenberg's uh, work. You know, who's I would say Dr. Rosenberg is, is a pioneer in this space of uh, cancer immunotherapy been working on it for so long. So yeah, so I think on that side, uh, that's happening. And then when you look at the gene therapy side, it's really exciting as well, where, you know, we, we all know uh, there's about 7,000 rare diseases in the world. And of course, innumerable number of mutations and uh, that need to be targeted. But using adeno-associated viruses or lentiviruses, one can target them and make the gene correction um, and then, of course, you have this whole CRISPR, CAS, and gene editing technologies that have come out. So all in all, phenomenally exciting time. I feel very grateful, very lucky to be, you know, in this time, at this moment, uh, being able to at least uh, work on these types of things. Yeah, I just I, just yesterday I interviewed uh, Deborah Barton um, from Charisma, and uh, they're focused on uh, CAR M therapy. You know, right. macrophage. Right. Yeah. So, um, and I certainly have spent a little bit of time talking to um, you know the team at, at the University of Colorado as well about you know, just their work in CRISPR. Just sounds amazing, and um, uh, you know, to somebody like me who doesn't really do this on a day to day basis, just getting to hear you know those portions of the story of you know how we're working on therapies and what what a tremendous uh, opportunity it's going to be for the future. Yeah. What can you tell me about your dissertation from Clemson and uh, your talks about HPRL, human prolactin, and how it would impact breast cancer? Yeah, you know, the, the, the work uh, was uh, very inspiring at that time. In fact, my advisor had invented a growth hormone receptor antagonist, which actually made it into the market, took the growth hormone, just made one amino acid change in the growth hormone, and it became an uh, antagonist. So it was used to treat acromegaly in people with excessive secretion of growth hormones. So uh, my advisor thought that uh, since growth, ho uh, growth hormone and prolactin belong to, uh, they have a lot of similarities in, 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 in the protein sequences and structure. And he thought perhaps we could uh, engineer prolactin uh, and uh, in a way that it becomes an antagonist and prolactin is also known to be a growth factor for breast cancer. Of course, the most popular growth factor in breast cancer is estrogen. So uh, we were some of the early folks that thought prolactin had a role to play in this. Uh, and someone like Barbara Wanderha from NCI had done a lot of work in this space. 
And so that's sort of what made us think that we could target it. And again, you make one amino acid change in prolactin and it becomes a prolactin antagonist. So what it does is it basically, the cancer cell is always looking for growth factors. So prolactin is one of those growth factors. So it's always chugging down as much growth factor as possible so that it can grow and multiply and become a big tumor. So if you block it, you are removing access to the growth factor. You're applying the brakes. And so that's what kills the cancer cell. So what I discovered, original discovery, actually in the middle of the night, classic science experiment, I did this and I saw that I found out how this uh, prolactin antagonist was killing the cancer cell, the breast cancer cell. It was doing it by apoptosis, which is a phenomenally programmed way in which the cell dies. Mm. And, and um, uh, so it was one of those exciting aha moments, you know, when uh, we knew it was uh, the cells were being killed by the prolactin antagonist, but how were they being killed? Uh, was was a good discovery. In any case, it didn't uh, make it to the clinic, or shall I say, I still have some hopes that it will. Um, but the very same principles uh, are used by uh, Herceptin, for instance, where you know you block uh, the HER2 HER2 new receptor on the breast cancer cell with an antibody. You know, in our case, we used a a a, a protein molecule, not an antibody, a protein, whereas um, the uh, antibody model seems to have uh, taken off uh, really big time, uh, which is really good. So the principle is the same, is how do you block the growth factor signaling, whatever the growth factor is, whether it's EGFR or HER2 nu or, uh, you know, in the case of Avastin, it's VEGF, you know. Yeah, sure. Vascular endothelial uh, cell growth factor. Yeah, it's just... Uh, I. I Again, I think there's there's um, true opportunities to potentially save lives in the end, right? Um, you know, with with some of these things, and um, you know, tremendous um, a, a tremendous find for you in in the in the wee hours of the night. So, uh, good job. <laughs> what are some of the greatest challenges that you're running into today? I think the the big challenges, uh, the way I see it, is I I don't see the challenges. I actually see the opportunities. You know, we all have challenges. Let's say in, in today's time, it, it has been all consumed by COVID-19. Mm. So one can sit here and say, oh my God, COVID has destroyed everything for me. Or you can say, what sort of opportunities do I see with COVID? And I'll list a few things. I think one of the things I've noticed in this country is I have not seen a time when doctors, nurses, scientists have been this respected or put on the spotlight. I think we need it. We need to inspire younger folks to take up the STEM career, you know, and I know pop singers and basketball players and football players have occupied a lot of our media limelight. I think I was in, in a sense, I, I was happy to see that mm -hmm. there is true recognition for people who yeah. are in this uh, and working in the background just to make a difference in human lives. Right. So, so I hope this uh, helps the younger generation to be inspired to pursue STEM careers in greater numbers. The other uh, two points I wanted to make, you know, one is, uh, you know, diagnostics as, a, as an industry, as a space has not received as much uh, attention and respect. Though, you know, 70% of the time, clinical decisions are made based on diagnostic tests. But tests have to be cheap. Uh, you don't get reimbursed that easily, particularly molecular tests and genomic tests are, don't get uh, reimbursed because they are expensive. Mm. So I, I, I feel like with this COVID, we were caught completely, you know, uh, you know, unprepared because we did not have that ecosystem, that model to sort of help diagnostic innovations make it. And I hope uh, there is some lasting change there that uh, is, uh, is, is a good one so that the industry is able to invest in innovations and point of care uh, sort of tests and near patient testing platforms and things like that, which I think home testing is going to become a way of life as we go forward, home-based testing for a lot of things. Um, and then the other thing is that discrete testing that we do is not going to be useful in detecting diseases earlier. We need a way to continually test ourselves. And so the sensors have to be cheap. 
the tests have to be easy to do and accessible and connected to some sort of a database and AI interface so that uh, you know all these interpretations can be automated. So I see a, a huge a revolution happening in you know in that space on the diagnostics front. So though it starts off with COVID, I think it should get into early detection of cancer, early detection of multiple sclerosis, Alzheimer's, and all sorts of diabetes and all sorts of chronic diseases, you know, where we have continual monitoring uh, with uh, all sorts of new technologies that, you know, we can go into details, you know, at some other point. Uh, vaccines have also been taken for granted. Vaccines have to be cheap. Uh, nobody cared about a vaccine. Now everybody wants a vaccine shot. So I am really, as someone who has worked in the vaccine space, you know, I'm so proud to see how much innovation has happened with vaccines. Again, I'll make the point that it starts off with COVID vaccines, but now when you look at these mRNA vaccines, they can actually be very useful for cancer, for autoimmune diseases, and so many other things. So the delivery platform is working, it's yeah, right. safe. So yeah. I think there is going to be a revolution that is going to be uh, already taken off, uh, you know, in in this uh, in this area. The other point I also want to make is many of these viral vaccines that are live, uh, that are potentially being going to be used for COVID. You know, again, this whole gene therapy area is also probably going to take off with the ability to manufacture these viruses. You know. Uh, uh, in a in a in a quality high quality GMP manner, right? So that uh, those are the the I would say those are the opportunities I see. Uh, on a philosophical note, you know, I I feel like the we have realized the world is a small village. We can <laughs> you know right. we are no longer isolated, uh, you know, from geography, uh, you know, or ethnicity or. Uh, nationality you know virus thousands of miles away can impact you within a few hours or within a day or two you know you'd get it um so i feel like we should all have this global mindset of we are all citizens of the world as opposed to citizens of a particular country and uh, right. try to do good for everybody else because with COVID, practically you want to vaccinate the whole world you don't want new strains coming and hitting you again yeah, so it's a class that sixty percent, you know, around the world, we're not going to have herd immunity. Uh, right. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So this is one one thing that has had its devastating effects on on people's health, uh, mortality, livelihood, and all of that. But I think uh, the lesson to be learned is we need to reach out and help everybody else get better health care. You know, the world needs to have. Uh, you know, any 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 by any poor countries need to be supported in in ways, and then this whole this whole climate change, which is not the main topic of discussion, all of those things bind us together uh, as one uh, you know as one global village, and so we have to cooperate and and uh, and uh, engage you know with the, with the whole world as a whole. Yeah, and you could see, I mean. Because to me, it's not just the evolution of COVID that, that you see now, but I mean, for years, we've been talking about, you know, SARS and MERS and then, you know, now COVID um, and then all the different strains of COVID. Um, it, and it's, you know, to me, it's, it's almost as if these things are going to keep coming mm -hmm. and we need brilliant scientists to continually be working on, okay, so what's, what's next? Mm -hmm. And, uh, and to your point, attracting, you know, the next generation of science leaders to, to go do that is important. Also, you know, you know, kind of showing people what, what it might feel like to find a discovery in the middle of the night and how exciting that, you know, might be, you know, I think is also a story that needs to, needs to continually be told as well. Mm -hmm. Totally agree. Totally agree. Yeah. So in, if you could have a conversation with any leader about the challenges that you faced, who would you want to speak with and what would you want to ask about? Well, I've always been fascinated by uh, spiritual people, though I'm a scientist, you know, I have always constantly been fascinated with uh, spiritual folks. And one of my current gurus is, is a mystic and yogi. His name is Sadhguru Jaggi Vasudev, who founded the Isha Foundation. And, you know, it's amazing. All of these folks uh, come from very basic middle class families. And suddenly they, over a period of decades, they their message reaches millions of people. I'm always fascinated how 
how do they inspire millions of people and how do they take on this huge global projects mind you with all volunteers right you yeah. can't fire any volunteers my guru says <laughs> you know you have to run this and you make all these huge things happen like he's done huge environmental initiatives he's built a whole uh, a big uh, yoga center and ashram in tennessee uh, and and uh, so many other things going on so to me it's like mind boggling to think about it how do you reach that many people mm. and how do you make that many people follow follow you and i'm sure the answer is once you are enlightened and spiritually accomplished um you know the universe and the world comes together for you in in ways that you know i think someone like myself couldn't even imagine but it'd be nice to have that sort of conversation very good and there are three questions that i like to ask every guest so what inspires you my inspiration comes from seeing people who who need to be helped you know is to have this empathy you know as uh, satya nadella says you know innovation doesn't happen without empathy mm. and and so is to innovate to have this empathy but also be inspired in a way that you try to want to make a difference in the lives of people who are suffering from whatever disease it is i'm quite disease agnostic I've, uh, as you know my own family have had cancer and had autism and there are other families that suffer from multiple sclerosis or you know alzheimers or cardiovascular or whatever it is right but the idea is to every patient is suffering and how to help right yeah, very good what concerns you i think the big concern i have is the world is not an equitable place how how do we break the barriers so that these amazing medical innovations that we are talking about are not just restricted to the rich countries you know even if you take the covid vaccine you know only the rich countries have access to the covid vaccine you know a lot of the poorer countries don't have the money to buy or are waiting in line because all the rich countries like our country we've all gone and bought uh, uh, a, a pre booked stocks of these you know vaccines so this is a classic uh, case of uh, you know medical innovations uh, not being evenly distributed i know it's not exactly going to happen that you You, you you wave a magic wand and you know it happens that way but one needs to be cognizant of how lucky we are and how much can we share with uh, the uh, people who are not as fortunate or with countries that are not as fortunate yeah i think i, I was a bit surprised um i i interviewed uh, julio martinez clark uh, a few episodes back and uh, he had said in latin america you know they could wait anywhere from 5 to 10 years for uh anything that's currently coming out in terms of you know diagnostic devices and and things like that and it was just a really it was a surprising moment for me right. uh, here being you know somebody that grew up you know here in the united states and i've certainly traveled the world spent a fair amount of time in in india and other countries but you know just never thought about that disparity until until he happened to mention it as well so right. you know, for sure is it is a big concern uh, around the world right and what excites you i think the immense possibilities and the potential of what science and technology can do to make lives better and healthier but also how we can reset all the harm that we have done to the the world and the the glow you know the uh, mother earth in terms of pollution and all of that so i think i see immense possibilities uh, there secondly is also think about the immense possibilities of the non material aspects of life of how one could just look inwards and do so much more than what we are even able to imagine and and uh, and so those those two things excite me the the possibilities of science the possibilities of spirituality to make this a better uh, world for all of us Yeah, it's for sure uh, an exciting time and and uh definitely, you know, getting a bit more attention at the moment as well. So uh so that is exciting for sure. Praveen Ramamurthy, thank you so much for spending time with me today on the podcast. I greatly appreciated our conversation and thanks for being here. Thank you so much, Don. It was uh, an honor, a privilege and uh just an amazing opportunity to to have this conversation with you. Thanks a lot.